Well, good evening, this is the West Shore Photography Club special meeting tonight on Wednesday, the February the 2nd, 2021. Our meeting tonight is a special meeting where Mike Donovan is going to be giving us a class preview primer on a trip we're gonna take on Sunday to see the works of Lewis Hine. And we'll get into that in uh, just a moment. But before we do, we wanted to start the meeting off with some announcements. Um, on Saturday, we have a field trip to the Strasbourg Railroad. And this is gonna be in a nice warm, dry spot, but it's a big museum. It's like a football field site. Think of that in your head. And so you get some really cool shots inside. So we encourage you to take uh, do that. The admission is $10 about that. And uh, we're gonna meet there at 10 o'clock on Saturday because that's when they open. And then on Sunday, we're gonna have a field trip and that's at 11 o'clock. And that's to the Lewis Hines show over at the Lebanon Valley College, the Suzanne Art Gallery. And that'll take about an hour and an hour and a half. And we're just, and Mike will, will walk us through the, uh, or the photographs of Lewis Hine. We're gonna see a lot of them this evening, but he will then, it's, it's totally different when you see him up front in front of you. Then I wanna make a, a, a note here that on Sunday, if you're gonna be participating, which we certainly hope you do, uh, by posting images on the, um, let me mute uh, some folks here. And, uh, the, did I get rid of the people? Wait a minute. Oh my gosh. Uh, no, I didn't. I, um, we have, I thought I, I, I kicked everybody off, but I didn't, okay. <laughs> so um, the uh, West Shore Historical Society and the West Shore Photography Club are, are uh, partnering on a uh, series of images in the uh, West Shore Historical Society's area of images. And so we are, we had a session last Wednesday night about that, and we're gonna get an email tomorrow. You need to have a thumbnail of the images that you will eventually be printing and displaying. You need to have a thumbnail of those in by on Sunday night, and that'll be a note on tomorrow's email that you'll get. We also have an image review coming up next Monday night and that's with Chris Heisey, and there is no um, theme for that, and uh, the images are due for that on Thursday night also. So tonight, and do we have um, Barbara with us tonight? Barbara McNulty, are you with us tonight? Yes. Oh, she is? yes. Okay, great. Thank Hi. you. Hi. Um, we're, we, tonight, our session is uh, with, with Mike, Mike Donovan, and he is going to be presenting the uh, works of uh, Lewis Hine. And I have to tell you, Mike is really passionate about this guy. He knows everything about him. And he told me he would limit his presentation to a four hours. And the reason why he did that, because that's the amount of storage we have when we record these things. Okay, <laughs> but no, seriously, Mike is, is um, going to give us a, a nice presentation and, and purpose, preparation for our trip on Sunday. And on Sunday, um, Dr. McNulty, who is with us tonight, who is the director of the uh, Suzanne Arnold Art Gallery at Lebanon Valley College, and she's going to be there to greet us and to welcome us and talk a little bit about the Lewis Hine exhibit. And uh, Barbara, do you have any comments or to start? Well, just we're really looking forward to your visit. Uh, we're wrapping up our installation. And for those of you that can't make it, I just wanted to mention a few events. Uh, if you can't make it on Sunday, uh, we have an opening tomorrow evening from, or I'm sorry, uh, Friday evening from five to seven. We're also going to be having a lecture um, by Dr. Shannon Egan uh, from Gettysburg College on, um, let's see the date of that is uh, March 17th at five. Uh, and, and we're having a musical uh, performance with Jay Smarr. He's a musician and history enthusiast 
and he's going to be doing songs and stories, sort of folkloric uh, that go uh, to the theme of some of the coal mines and other photographs that uh, Lewis Hine uh, took. And we also have a photography workshop um, by Andrew Bale, if you're interested, Saturday, March 26th. I don't have all of the details for that yet, but we'll be posting that uh, on our website. And when that come, when you get that information, if you could pass us to us, I think our members will be uh, interested in that. It's okay. a local work, is that a local workshop here in Lebanon? Yes, it will be uh, at, at, at the college. And Andy Bale is a professor at Dickinson College, a local photographer. I don't know. Maybe some of you are familiar with his work. Okay. Um, but people really enjoy his workshops. Okay, great. That's be good. March 26th, we got that down. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Mike, I'm going to turn it over to you now for the presentation this evening. All right, thank you. And, and thanks to everybody who who came this evening. There's, I think, 25 or 26 people. I appreciate you giving up your evening for this. Um, one thing I might mention is that there's a video early in the presentation. You may have to turn up your volume to, to hear it well. I don't know. Um, we practiced it a little bit and, and everybody could hear, but we'll see. Um, one of the reasons that I'm so respectful of Lewis Hine is because of my background as an elementary school teacher. I taught third and fourth grade for 33 years. And I really can't think of anyone else who did more for children than Lewis Hine. And it really kind of sticks in my craw that nobody knows about him. And all of us, and I'll mention this later, all of us who are kids owe him. We owe him in a big, big way. And uh, hopefully when we're finished here, you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay, now let me try the share screen technique. Okay. All right. There we go. Okay, are we full screen? We are full screen. Okay, and everybody can hear. Uh, yep, I've even, even though I muted them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, I call this photography with a conscience because Lewis Hine made his photography do things for us. Lewis Hine was born in humble beginnings in 1874. He studied sociology at a number of universities and eventually became a teacher at the Ethical Culture School in New York City. Hine was a keen photographer and during his time teaching, encouraged his students to use photography as an educational medium. On one of his many field trips to Ellis Island, he came to the realization that in addition to their educational value, photos could also be used as a tool for social change and reform. When he started a new role as the photographer for the NCLC, the National Child Labor Committee, he was about to start work on what would be his most impactful work. Over a period of 10 years, he documented the use of child labor in the various industries around the states of North and South Carolina. You might not think so, but this was actually quite dangerous for work. The NCLC's mission was to end the practice of child labor, and a lot of factories wanted to hide that they used kids for work. So Hine was often threatened with violence or death by foremen or factory police. This meant that in order to get the photos, at various times he had to pose as a fire inspector, a postcard vendor, a Bible salesman, and even an industrial photographer making a record of factory machinery. As you can see, his work was incredible. Not only are the photos beautifully set up, but they are so very human.
Pine's work was instrumental in bringing the issue of child labor to light and getting the reality in front of the eyes of the general public. Ultimately, the practice of child labor came to an end. Pine remained a photographer for the rest of his career, and his next most famous work is his recording of the construction of the Empire State Building. He died at 66 years of age, and though he was penniless at the time, he left behind quite a legacy. His work had been critical in the ending of child slavery, and even today, the National Child Labor Committee remains active and each year gives out the Lewis Hine Award to people who have worked hard as advocates for children. By using his name, the committee honors both the work he did and the impact he made in the lives of young people all over America. As a teacher and you and I as former children and many of you as parents really should know about this man and that's what I'm hoping to share with you tonight. Lewis Hine was born in Oshkosh, Wisconsin in 1874. His father was a Civil War veteran and his mother was an educator. His father died when Lewis was 18 years old, which meant Lewis had to go to work. His first job was in a furniture upholstery factory where he worked 13 hours a day, six days a week, and earned $4 a week. He had other labor intensive jobs and he saw firsthand the exploitation of young children as workers. He was determined to avoid that kind of life and he attended three different colleges and finally became a teacher. You might notice he's always dressed up so so sharp and that he's kind of kind of a mousy looking guy but the guy had the heart of a lion as you'll see he was hired in 1901 as a teacher of nature study and geography at the ethical culture school in new york city he became the school photographer and it was his responsibility to document the social and academic aspects of the school he developed a love and a respect for photography, and that led to a project in which he and his students went to Ellis Island to photograph the newly arrived immigrants. He was hoping that his photographs would bring the, those immigrants the same respect that, say, the pilgrims seemed to have, and they were really nothing more than immigrants. He eventually left teaching and became a full-time photographer. He's best known for four major projects. The Ellis Island Project, the Pittsburgh Survey, and I hope Mary Fox is here tonight because she's from Pittsburgh. The um, Child Labor Committee work, which is his best known work, and the construction of the Empire State Building. Now, many of you always wanna know, well, what kind of equipment do you use? What kind of camera do you have? Look at, well, here's his camera. It was a Graflex, you can see a five by seven. It was a, it was a view camera, meaning there was, the viewfinder was a ground glass. And that's why he has that contraption on top to block the light instead of using a blanket over his head. Uh, the flash pan that, oh, he originally used glass slides, five by seven glass slides, and then later sheet film. The flash pan, is a sort of like a piece of angle iron, maybe two feet long. And flash powder was sprinkled onto the, uh, the angle and then lit. And originally they were lit with matches, but then later um, dry cell batteries and Lewis Hine would light it with a dry cell battery and poof, smoke and light and the whole works. Of course, he used a tripod many times um, it's if you've been to Ellis Island, you know, it's pretty dark in there. And of course, he would have to carry the flash powder with him. It, there was none of this. Should I use a backpack or a fanny pack? There was none of that. Let's look at his Ellis Island photographs. His project, as you can read, went for five years. And it started as a school project. 
he took his students there, his classes, to photograph the arriving immigrants. And he began to realize that documentary photography could be used for social change and for reform. So he photographed at Ellis Island for about five years. And the thing about these Ellis Island photographs that I'd really like you to pay attention to are the faces, the hope and the dreams and the, I don't know, the looking forward to the future, but yet you'll see fear and worry about the unknown. And one other thing, you see that bag on his back there? That's probably his worldly possessions coming to a brand new world. And Lewis Hine was there to document it. Remember, flash powder. There were thousands of people in Ellis Island, and he did not speak their languages. So he would have to gather immigrants off to the side, try and pose them, set them up, all for the sake of showing what they had to go through to get to America. And as photographers, as you're looking, you might realize these are quality photographs. They're also portraits, the hopes and dreams. Look at that face. This is my favorite. It's like they're climbing the stairway to what they see as heaven. Paperwork in their hands. Look at that kid. So his projects, his project at Ellis Island, really I think is what led him to want to photograph working people and um, laborers, because many of these people ended up living in tenements and working for peanuts. So their hopes and their dreams maybe didn't work out like they wanted. I want to let you have another minute to look at this. Talk about excitement. Now the Pittsburgh survey um, happened after he was hired as a staff photographer what's, for what's known as the Russell Sage Foundation, which still goes on today. It exists to promote improved social and living conditions in the United States. So he was hired to photograph the steelmaking district and the people of Pittsburgh for the Pittsburgh survey. It was more of like a, oh, like a sociology project, I guess you'd say. So what he did there was, again, the people and their working conditions. And you can tell by looking at his work that he respected working people. And look, at the, look at the quality of the photograph. In the portrait, the eyes have it, and he knew that. That's what Pittsburgh used to look like. These girls, and you can see there's tons of them back there, are rolling cigars for people who have extra money to smoke. And again, they ended up living a lot of them in tenements. So this is the, um, the Pittsburgh survey. As you can well imagine, there's plenty of steel mill shots and that kind of thing. I love this picture because of the respect all these workers seem to have for each other. Look at conditions these people worked in. And Lewis Hine was there setting up his cameras. Again, the eyes have it. In 1908, Hine became the photographer for the National Child Labor Committee. He left his teaching position, and for the next 10 years, Lewis Hine documented the use of child labor in the United States. 
And really, this is this is what he's most famous for. And this is what originally drew me to him. His initial focus was in North and South Carolina where children were used in cotton mills and textile factories, but he also photographed newspaper delivery kids, not people, telegram delivery children and children working in the coal mines, including in our very own state. This is one of his most famous child labor photographs. You can see her name is Addie Card and she was on a postage stamp, a US postage stamp. Um, she lived to the age of 94, but never really had much. She lived in low income housing on social security. And sadly, Lewis Hine ended up in the same situation. I love his quote, I am more interested in persons than I am in people. And I'm finding that to be really true with this pandemic. The more I stay at home, the more I like individual persons rather than people. These are the, uh, the steel mills, I'm sorry, the uh, textile mills and the cotton mills. And I'm gonna ask you again, look at their faces. They look so old. There's fear in their eyes. And again, he had to pretend he was a salesman or there to photograph the machinery or, I mean, he risked his life literally to get these photographs. I looked at this and looked at it and I saw two people with a smile. Look at the little girl on the left by the machine. They go to work every day, 10, 12 hours. So they wouldn't just work in factories. I told you when kids have to be like adults, they're gonna be like adults. Look at them, they look like they're 35 years old. These kids work for Western Union, delivering telegrams. Now the newspaper delivery kids, mostly boys, had to get up early enough to get their papers and then be ready to sell to the men who were going to work. And sometimes they just couldn't do it anymore. They needed a break. Lewis Hine was there to get the shots. Now, Pennsylvania and West Virginia, our own state, we didn't really um, acquit ourselves well here either. His work with the Child Labor Committee was often dangerous and he was often threatened with uh, violence or death by factory police or foremen because they didn't want people to know that they had children working for them. Now these group shots, uh, many times what Hein would do is figure out when the shift changed. And when the shift changed, if he wasn't allowed into the mine, when the shift changed, he quickly gathered all the kids, got the shot and got out of there and left them go home. But look again, the quality of the shot. And if that shot doesn't pull your heartstrings, then look at your own children, what they did. They went to school. Now this kid, uh, you see he has a whip around his neck. There were mules in the coal mines that pulled carts once they got the ore put in or the coal. And um, I'm thinking he was probably a drover who kept the mules moving. There were two different groups of mules uh, ones that were underground their whole lives, and they were afraid to go into sunshine because they had, had not seen it. So they would have other mules that would come from the sunshine down, pick up the cart, and then take it back out again. And I'm guessing this kid was one who kept it moving. 
These are breaker boys. And what they would do is actually they would be sitting with their backs to us and their feet up on the bars that you see that looks like pipes. And the coal that you can see underneath runs on conveyor belts. And then they would have to grab any rocks or any debris or anything out of there while the coal was going at a fairly high rate of speed underneath their feet. So broken fingers, um, they tried gloves. You see the kid down in the corner has gloves on, just horrible. Look how young they are. When I was that old, I was trying to get money to buy baseball cards and look at them. This kid was in charge of the door. Now, Lewis Hine lit that with the flash powder, but you can see there's a flame on top of his helmet. That's the only light he had all day long. This kid was a, I guess, a greaser, for lack of a better word, a lubricator. He's carrying buckets full of grease or oil to keep the uh, machinery running. Here's some other jobs that kids had as well. Those are oyster shells. She was an oyster shucker. A cotton picker. Look at the size of the bag she had to fill before she could go back in. Look at her face. <laughs> These are pin boys at the bowling alley. They would sit on those seats, benches, while the patrons bowled. And you can imagine those pins flying up and whacking them. Or just plain straight manual labor. I believe they're picking blueberries. And that's a whole family. The, the man in the middle there is the father. And he had to bring his whole family to work in order to survive. Of course, all this came at a cost to the children. And again, Lewis Hine was there to photograph it. What he would do with these images is relay them to newspapers, to um, the Child Labor Committee would put out posters, brochures, um, flyers, and they would use his photographs to show the general public what was happening to these children. What these children had to do in order for those people to eat oysters or smoke cigars. Now, after his time, he spent 10 years with the Child Labor Committee. And when that project came to an end because child labor was outlawed, he then went to work for the Red Cross during World War I. And his job there was to photograph the good things that the Red Cross was doing to help people. I want you to see this. He also photographed people at work. He had a, there was a book of his photographs called Women at Work and another one called Men at Work. This is one of his most famous photographs right here. He's got about five or six that people instantly recognize. They don't know who did it, but they recognize them. And look at the, um, the respect that he's showing to working people. And remember again, He's dragging that big Graflex camera around. Now, when that work came to a close during the Depression, the um, Empire State Building was being built. And he was hired in 1930 to document the building of the Empire State Building. Now, his photographs revealed the risks and the precarious situations that the workers found themselves in. But remember this, Lewis Hine put himself in the same situations to get the shot. 
He took many of those risks in a basket. They made a basket for him that could swing out, of, out above Fifth Avenue for him to take the shots. He said that he was hanging above Fifth Avenue with nothing but a quarter mile of air in between. Now, one other thing is there's a really famous shot of everybody sitting on the beam eating lunch. That's not him. That photo was taken at the um, Rockefeller Center construction site. There were three photographers there, and there's kind of a squabble over which one really did it. But many people think it was Lewis Hine, but from what I can find, I don't, it wasn't. But look at these guys. Now, I don't know if you can see it on your screen or not, but this guy is supposed to have his finger on the tip of the Chrysler building. You know how tourists always do that? Hold up the Leaning Tower of Pisa and all that kind of thing. This is um, reminiscent of the story of Daedalus and Icarus, who it's a Greek myth that they wanted to fly high. So they made um, wings out of feathers and wax. And one of the other ones, I forget if it was Daedalus or Icarus, went crazy and I'm going as high as I can. Well, he got too close to the sun, the wax melted, the feathers fell out and he fell to his death. And that's what people relate this picture to heading up toward the sun. <laughs> Look at that. So you can see all through his career, he had real respect for working people. And that's why it hurt him so bad to see children doing this kind of thing. Now, during the Depression, Hein worked again for the Red Cross. He worked for the Tennessee Valley Authority, um, documenting life in eastern Tennessee. And he was a chief photographer for the Works Progress Administration, which documented industry and its effects on employment and society. He got into teaching again. He became a faculty member at the Ethical Culture Fieldstone School. The last years of his life were filled with struggle. There was a loss of government and corporate patronage. He was hoping to join the Farm Security Administration, but was turned down repeatedly. People weren't interested in his work anymore. He was really, he was forgotten, which I can't imagine somebody who saved the lives of all those children was forgotten, but he was. Since he had no work, he lost his house. He had to apply for welfare. He lived in low income housing. And in 1940, at the age of 66, Hein died following complications from a surgery. Now, the bulk of his negatives and prints you can find at the Eastman House in Rochester, New York, and there's some in the Library of Congress as well in Washington, D.C. Now, to me, as a former elementary school teacher and having an interest in photography, I really can't see anybody more important to the children of this country than Lewis Hine. His photography saved lives. And that's to be honored and to be respected. You all were kids. You didn't have to do, and I didn't have to do, what those children did in those photographs. And it's because of him. So he's got my undying gratitude and certainly my respect. Now, on Sunday at 11 o'clock, February 6th, you can see his actual prints. Um, it says the show is called Our Strength is Our People. You can tell why it's called that now that you've seen his work. And it's vintage prints. It's the it's old ones, the real ones. So I'll be there and hopefully I won't yak your ear off. Um, the guy's just a giant in my book, just a giant. Appreciate you listening. Thank you very much.
if you're muted, you can unmute yourself. If you have a question for, for Mike at all, Mike, that was absolutely stunning presentation. It just, Thank it, really, you. It, it just puts, brings a tear to your eye when you see kids like this all throughout with bare feet. Now those shells are so, so, uh, you know, sharp. It's yeah. just amazing. It's amazing. You can tell you the passion you have for him and I can see why. Absolutely outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Mike. Yes. This is Mark. Um, I got two, two things. Um, first off, thank you very much for this. I found this really, really uh, impressive. Oh, good. Uh, Thanks. I, I've seen some of his work, but I, like you said, I, I've seen some of them, but I've never related the name to it. And um, yeah. I wanted to make a comment about, especially the kids working in the textile mills. Right. My first job was as a laborer in a textile mill. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> and the other, the thing that the photos don't get across is at that time, there was no safeguards. There was no safeties on any of that equipment. The Correct. stuff was flying everywhere. And also it was extremely noisy. Those machines made such a racket. I don't imagine, I would imagine by the age of 16, a lot of them are hard of hearing. Yeah, I would think you're right. Yeah, because I remember one of the guys that I worked with as um, in the textile mill, he, he couldn't hear a thing with those machines running. Even when the machines were off, he was like tone deaf. Um, the, um, the, I'm sorry, Mark, go ahead. Go ahead. And the other one is your comment about him being hoisted out in a crane. In a, <laughs> yeah. a crane. Um, I've had that experience. That's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's not. Even when carrying an eight, even he had to carry an eight pound camera around. It, even when it's only 200 feet up and the thing's swinging back and forth instead of a quarter <laughs> mile, it's not enjoyable. <laughs> the um, the photograph of Addie Card, people think that she had a broken arm or something happened with her arm in a machine maybe, or because it just, it doesn't look right. Yeah. Now, no, there's no proof of it, but people who have studied these photographs, that's what they think. Yep. And it, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah. Mark, how old were you when you started there? I was 16. That's young enough. But, um, this girl here, it said, started when she was eight. Yeah, I started at 16 and lasted barely till 17 and found other work. <laughs> Good thinking. Hi. Yes. This is a beautiful presentation. I, I have to hand it to you. You really done well putting this together. Oh, thanks, and, Norbert. And I definitely agree. Some of these photographs are spectacular as far as the quality of the of the I know. you know the contrast and all this. Is, it's just beautiful how they're and, yeah. And I can see how you're very passionate about this being a teacher. You know, with uh, with the elementary te uh, kids because this this was like I never realized all this happened. Really, I didn't. Yep. yep. Well, this picture right here is on the front of a children's book about Lewis Hine. And I had, I had it in my classroom and I, you know, I'd look at him sitting there and think, geez, these kids could be in a coal mine if it wouldn't be for him. Yeah, you know, this is something else that's kind of interesting. Some of these photographers that were documenting things at, at that time, you know, around, around the turn of the century and all, were not really recognized. And now, after they've passed away, now they're recognized for their work. I know. You know, you know that happens a lot, I see. Well, what's lousy is the poor guy barely was skimping by when he, at the end of his life. Yeah, yeah, something. Yeah, thank thanks, you, Robert. I... Anyone else? Mike, has anybody, do you know if anyone has ever thought of trying to, to put a push on to recognize him, uh, like maybe uh, uh, a day every year because of what he did for the children? That would be nice, but he's kind of forgotten now. Now there was, after he passed away, I'm looking here in my notes. I think it was Dorothea Lang, but I, yeah, here we go. No, Berenice Abbott, who was a well-known female photographer, and Elizabeth McCausland, who was an art critic. Um, they had visited with Lewis Hine 
not long before he passed away, and they organized like a retrospective of his work. But without that, it probably he'd be totally forgotten. But yeah, I, I mean, as far as kids go, he's the man. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, this I, is uh, Dave Marchetto, and just want to congratulate you on a awesome, passionate presentation. Oh, thanks, Dave. I'm glad you liked it. Thanks for sticking it out the whole way. <laughs> well, there's uh, there's plenty more to come uh, now that you've kind of laid at some of the foundation here. You know, it almost reminds me of some of the composers, you know, lives of some of the uh, romantic and classical composers who only after their, you know, their their deaths did they become, you know, enormously yep. famous yep. and popular. Popular. Mike, I wanted to do uh, from a technical uh, point, I wanted to point out the amazing use of leading lines and perspective on some of those uh, shots with the, um, the spools of wool, where you yeah. have these, these incredible machines coming in from right and left spools, and you follow the line right to the, uh, to the child. I mean, that's just really, there you go. It's really remarkable. There's so many of these that even in your presentation, you showed, even there's one I could remember in my mind's eye on each side. I mean, it, it just focuses literally right at, there you go, that's the one. Yeah. I mean, that's really remarkable. And <laughs> um, from a technical standpoint, uh, even you know, like today, uh, whatever, uh, I mean, if, if he didn't understand leading lines, I, I don't know who, who did. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> And, and his, his use of depth of field was fabulous. Absolutely. And, you know, with, whatever lenses he had and so forth, I mean, I, I don't know if they had wide angle lenses on those Graflex cameras or whatever, but it didn't seem to stop him. <laughs> no. Did I mention his vest buttons? No. no. Okay, well, what he did was the buttons on his vest, he would measure how far off the floor they were. And then he would stand by the child and know how tall the child was. Oh my gosh. Because he oh took my notes my. about these kids and included that in the articles that appeared in the paper or the magazines or whatever. So he could say, you know, this child is 11 years old and stands three feet, nine inches or whatever. So, I mean, he was no dummy. He, he was a pretty sharp guy. Yeah, I've read, Mike, where these children like this little girl, many of them lost fingers and hands and yes. several died in yes. these kind of, of mills. You are correct. And the thing of it is, <laughs> the mill owners, I mean, kids were easy to replace. Yep. And they were cheap. And they would do what they were told. So really the owner of the mill is at fault. I mean, their parents, some of them would have starved without their kids working. But as I said, there's, there's a price to pay for it. Uh, I have a question for Barbara, if you're here, Barbara. How does the uh, Suzanne Arnold Art Gallery take position, possession on, for some of these images? And is it temporary or how does that work? Well, uh, this is a loan through Art to Art uh, Traveling uh, Exhibitions. We've uh, received a number of loans from them. They specialize in photography shows. Our Dorothea Lang show uh, was through them, as well as uh, Danny Lyon, I believe. Um, and so when we get these shows, first of all, they're quite expensive. Uh, to um, pay for the loan. And then, of course, there's the shipping uh, coming from different venues, and that's quite expensive, too. Uh, and so when we get these loans, uh, we have to sign a contract. And, of course, you have to have uh, a gallery that is secure and has certain heating, lighting, and humidity conditions. And so today, my intern, Matt, and I were working on the lighting. Uh, the contract stipulates it shouldn't be above 10 lumens. 
to protect the photography because you know these are vintage prints and it's kind of exciting a couple of them actually uh, the mat board is signed by Lewis Hine mm -hmm. uh, so uh, they were mounted uh, by him a few of them anyway thank you Barbara yes who, who actually owns it yeah owns this uh all these exhibitions this photographic works that you're showing do they come from a from a private individual or are they from a gallery, yes. a gallery? Um, art to art circulating exhibition you might want to go to their website uh, because they have a number of different photographers represented and they sort of organize this but there will be different owners uh, so for instance these works are from the private collection of Michael Mattis and Judith Hochberg. Mm. And so, um, yeah. And we, you know, they, they come shipped in this huge crate. Um, and we, when they come in, of course, we have to let it uh, sit and in, in this weather and acclimate uh, to the temperature of the gallery. We don't want to start to unpack it, you know, because of being shipped in cold conditions, uh, you know, the photographs might be a little more brittle. And so we have to take a lot of care in that. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. I'm bringing this, by the way, for, for showing Lewis Hines work because really none of us would ever get to see it otherwise. Yeah. Well, we're really excited. Uh, you know, when I plan these uh, exhibitions, they're usually a couple years in the making. And um, I was going to have a speaker, uh, a lecturer who had written a book on Hein. And since COVID, he has retired and is no longer traveling. So, um, you know, that that was a disappointment. And also, I don't know, Mike, um, you... you you really have a lot of information. I was so interested in what you had to say and also about the equipment that he uses. I don't often, <laughs> I'm not able to answer those questions and I appreciate <laughs> you had that information for us. I'm, I'm kind of more on the aesthetic side than the technical. Right. Um, but, but one thing, if you do Google this, uh, there was a website I called Warnings on the Second Show. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, it was founded by a guy named Joe Manning, and he took it upon himself to try and Is track game down you um, the people that were in these photographs. And so you may want to look at that and read some of those stories. And oh. I thought it would have been fun to have him come in. And unfortunately, he's passed away uh, oh. since Joe I. Joe Manning began Joe Manning. Yes, it's called Mornings on Maple Street. It's a collection of article stories and photographs uh, from the Lewis Hine project. Oh. Well, there's also a book for, it was written for middle school kids, a fictional book about a young girl named Grace who, who meets Lewis Hine and how it affects her life. And mm -hmm. uh, I can't offhand think of the name of the book right now which doesn't help anybody, I guess. Wonderful. So I, I was curious um, when we have our tour on Sunday, um, I think these photographs really offer a wonderful opportunity to talk about composition. Would you like to have that type of discussion as we had in the past? whatever you like that would be fine because like dave said there's there's part of the reason that these are so good is because they're actually photographs too they're not mm -hmm. just people like the one that's up on the screen now if anybody can see it i said he used depth of field just beautifully yeah. so we can do that whatever anybody wants sure and we we a number of the ones that you showed um, this evening are in the galleries. So oh, good. Fun. Yeah. I saw that your, your description of the show says that 
it includes the immigration experience, child labor, and the American worker. So that'll be perfect. It does. And and the Empire State Building uh, Good. project, too. Yeah. So, yeah, a little Dr. bit of everything. <laughs> Dr. McNulty. Yes. This is Terry. I have a question on on when when they send these photographs back and forth, I, I I caught that you said they were were matted. Do they not put them in frames and put uh, museum glass uh, on? Use museum glass to protect them from fading any further. Well, you know that's a good question. We were trying to figure that out, and I haven't asked. Um, the woman that I deal with, whether this is museum glass or not, I'm not sure uh, in answer to your question, but you know, yeah. I, I put that on any uh, photographs that we purchase in our collection. If you look at the glass, you can see a greenish tint. Mm -hmm. If that glass that they're using has that greenish tint, more than likely that's museum class yeah yeah that's why i'm not sure that it is but yeah maybe we can talk about that and maybe okay. well i can contact her too before then to find out thank you sure and and the other thing that we had to do with these um just a little and you can see it on sunday we had to attach security plates to all of these photographs uh, to the wall. So that's, it's just a little more involved in installing a show like this. Mike, this is Joe. When we talk about photography, uh, bringing out emotion and feeling, I think this presentation and his work brings that out in spades. I think Absolutely. you're right. Yeah. Uh, when I was trying to, I was going through this practicing and uh, like two or three times I'd get to the end and I'd be choked up. I, I couldn't finish. I was hoping it wouldn't happen tonight. Mm -hmm. Because of all the kids that I knew, you know, I dealt with, oh, over a thousand kids in my career and just picturing them down in there, you know, or, or getting caught up in a machine or waking up at 4 a.m. to get their newspapers or and, and they don't have to do any of that because of him. Mm -hmm. And neither did we. Mike, for your uh, presentation, there just aren't a lot of dry eyes out here. Uh, maybe <laughs> yours are, but uh, good to uh, know. <laughs> you, you're 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 very passionate and it shows and the um, the the feeling is mutual oh thanks I'm glad i'm not alone trying to swallow a glass of water quick <laughs> <laughs> well i like the way you showed his humanity i mean it just it was very touching presentation and and hey. i was just con uh contacted by a, a brownie leader today they want to bring a tour and i was thinking about some of the things that you said that you know it would be interesting to include for them or how Good. how Good. i could structure it that they would be interested yeah you know. yeah great mm -hmm. barbara this uh, presentation is going to be recorded and you'll get the link to it tomorrow oh, and you great. would be able, and you would be able to uh download it to your computer so you could have it for reference purposes if you wanted Thank in you. his talk and uh because in about a week or so it'll be uh off of our server so you have a short period of time to do that okay I wanted to mention too that uh, from here, uh, when I say here from Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, the drive over to Lebanon Valley College to the Suzanne Arnold Art Gallery is about 35 minutes. Um, and I just looked up on Google Maps. You live in Mechanicsburg, don't you, Barbara? Camp Hill. Oh, Camp Hill. And how long of a drive is it for you? You probably know. Well, I plan on 40 minutes from here. I go on. Um, 81, but you can go 422 or even old 22 through Harrisburg. Okay. Um, there's sort of three ways. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, any other final questions before we sign off for this evening? 
I saw some comments on the um, on the chat, and I want people to know that did that. I appreciate that. I just read them, and I want to thank them. Okay. Oh, yes, I do. Yeah. Okay. If everybody would, uh, we're going to sign off now. And Mike, thank you so much. You're, You're welcome. Wonderful. Thank you, thank, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you. See you Sunday. See you. Yay. That was wonderful, Mike. Well, let me turn off the recording. Good. A second. Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, it's okay. I don't mind if you're saying it's wonderful on the recording. <laughs> well, well, it was wonderful on the recording. Everybody <laughs> would, would know that. But I, we're running out of space. <laughs> I have to uh, stop the recording.